Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and I'm joined today by Naman Carl Thomas Haptum Desta. Naman is a Swedish PhD student at the University of Cambridge. He was previously a guest researcher at the Swedish Defense University, and his research in general focuses on Swedish post World War II uh, military and diplomatic history. His work appeared in various academic and popular journals. He worked um, in, uh, in, in a, on a history documentary research project, and um, he also was a research assistant at the Center for Geopolitics. So, uh, Naman, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for the invitation. Naman, you reached out to me um, recently because you're uh, editing a book about uh, neutral states and their uh, re their relationships in the Cold War, and you are particularly skilled about um, Sweden and Swedish foreign policy. You're yourself a Swede, and you've been um, you've been looking very closely at what Sweden is doing with uh, with NATO. Right, Sweden is trying to join NATO, and you wrote a very interesting article recently that you that you published online uh, so could you maybe tell us where this accession swedish accession to nato is standing today and how this whole process over the last year has been going so at the moment the situation is uh, up in the air to be honest um the turkish government erdogan in particular has said that um at the current moment he's not going to approve swedish membership they sort of hinted that maybe he'll allow Finland, but not Sweden. And he made this contingent on uh, whether or not Quran burnings are going to be legal in Sweden. Um, of course, it's not the first time he said no and then sort of said, well, we're open to it. So uh, it still remains a, very, a possibility that Sweden will ultimately join, although it's probably the least sure it's been so far. Um, so going back about a year, when Sweden did announce back in... Uh, announced his application to join NATO in May of last year. Uh, we saw a similar thing where uh, as soon as Sweden announced, having expected a rather rapid uh, accession, probably to be completed by July at the NATO Madrid uh, summit in July of last year, um, soon after Turkey announced that it was going to oppose it. And at that time, he used equally quite strong language saying there's no point of sending Swedish or Finnish representatives to Ankara to even discuss the matter. But then by July, they said, we're now actually open to it. And they signed a trilateral memo saying that if Sweden and Finland did certain things, then it would actually approve it. Since then, it's sort of gone back and forth a bit uh, at times. saying we've gotten positive signals, uh, for example, uh, changes in terms of terrorism related laws, a willingness to extradite uh, certain individuals. And um, I think the most tangible being Sweden reallowing arms exports to Turkey, which had been suspended since 2019 following the Turkish incursion into northern Syria. Beginning really in November of last year, the situation is worsened again. Um, we saw, for example, a couple of extradition requests that were denied. So in Sweden, extraditions are not decided by the government itself necessarily. It's usually a, uh, a judicial decision which the government can then choose to uh, carry out or not. And there were a couple of cases, including an individual that Erdogan had named himself in a press conference with the Swedish Prime Minister, Ulf Christoffersson. And this man uh, was then, um, his extradition was then denied. At times, uh, Turkey has also announced that they wanted more people. So it's not been a fixed number of extradition requests, at least in the public domain. Uh, we don't actually know what's going on behind the scenes. There's a formal request at times which can suggest that there haven't actually been any formal require, uh, requests or formal lists at times saying, well, these are the num names we have. But it's been sort of shifting on the ground. Because, may I just ask, because the, the issue is... Uh... Turkey can block with it, with its veto power um, Swedish accession, right? And Turkey has said very adamantly, you have to fulfill a, a little checklist in order for us to to actually agree. And some of 
these things are actually like extraditing Turkish nationals who are accused by Ankara of uh, being part of the of the Kurdish terrorist group, right? And Sweden has been basically a, a safe haven for them so far. And as you're saying now, Sweden, uh, the, the the judicial process is is judging that these people actually do deserve Swedish protection, right? Correct. Um, there's two groups. So one are the Kurds, uh, some Kurdish people in Sweden. Another is also people who are um, alleged to have been involved in the coup attempt in 2016. So these are sort of parallel events. So the example I mentioned, he was actually one in relation to the coup attempt uh, or being part of the Gulen movement, as, uh, or which Turkey consists of a terrorist organization as well. But I think most of attention has really been given to um, Kurdish-related extraditions. Like you mentioned, Sweden has had a long history, going back decades, of uh, accepting Turks, uh, Turkish Kurds uh, to Sweden, having given them asylum. Uh, some of these are recent arrivals, as you can imagine, who therefore would still be eligible for extradition. Sweden does not extradite its own citizens outside of the European Union or the Nordic countries. Uh, but some of these people are obviously on some sort of visa or uh, refugee status or at least have applied for refugee status um, and now so in mind. yeah and now uh, um, Sweden has actually signaled its willingness to at least try to live up to these demands right so the political pressure that Mr. Erdogan is putting on Sweden seems to be at least on a in in terms of like political dialogue seems to be successful in convincing the government to to at least try to somehow uh, live up to these to these requests but it's actually the independence of the justice system that's that's um blocking whatever is going on on um in terms of extraditions correct um i think the issue the swedish government is facing is that the turkish government at times have come with a very precise list of individuals they want so they'll say, we want A, B, and C. And the Swedish government isn't in a really in a capacity to do so. I mean, at least not to do so legally or without any uh, questionable measures. I mean, there have been some sort of parallels before. So in early, I think 2002, 2003 or so, the Bush administration had pressured the Swedish government to extradite two individuals to Egypt and uh, under threat of sanctioning the all, entirety of the European Union. And in that case, Sweden actually did do it. But... In the current situation, there is n- there's no legal mechanism to say, well, I, the prime minister, am going to sign the extradition of these people without any judicial oversight. So, and how is Turkey taking this? Um, because there's one more um, d- development now that about two weeks ago or 10 days ago, there was this uh, Swedish national who burned a Quran in front of the Turkish embassy in uh, in Stockholm, right? And this uh, caused major uproar in, in, in Turkey. Where Where is that discussion standing now? So that's actually caused both a uh, domestic political issue, but also a uh, bilateral issue, and also relation with this wider Islamic world, actually. Um, beginning with a bilateral one, uh, Tur- the, so the latest thing Erdogan has said is that as long as Sweden allows Quran burnings, it's not going to let Sweden into NATO. Mm-hmm. And the government has sort of drawn a red line saying, well, we're not going to uh, imp- change our freedom of speech laws and that the religion aspect is not a part of the uh, trilateral memo. There have been moves, for example, to whether or not membership of terrorist organization should be or, uh, should be criminalized because it's a slightly different uh, issues since in Sweden has been debated. Well, is membership the same thing as committing an t- act of terrorism? Uh, and this sort of created issue when it came to ISIS. And then now advancing that type of legislation, but when it came to the freedom of speech law, when it came to the Quran burning, then that's the government sort of been fixed on that. However, the prime minister, the foreign minister, they've sort of expressed uh, uh, a sympathetic tone to uh, agree with Muslims. So they've said, uh, this is uh, shameful, horrible, uh, disgusting, but it's legal. Mm-hmm. But then we still sympathize. However, domestically, this sort of created a rif- rift within uh, the broader right wing uh, parliamentary grouping, since the government consists of three parties the moderates, the Christian Democrats, and the liberals. However, they're governing in support with the Sweden Democrats, who are uh, not part of the government, but they're voting for their budget and so forth. 
The Sweden Democrats are perhaps most known internationally for being anti-immigration and particularly anti-Islamic immigration. And the government has been quite the Sweden Democrats have been critical of the way that the government has at times said we're sympathetic uh, towards uh, agreed sentiments. And yet, for example, the leader of Sweden Democrats saying, Emi Orkerson saying, uh, there's no reason to mollify us in Sweden. It's, it's allowed to burn a Quran, a Bible, or even a Pippi Longstocking book. So this has created an issue internally. Now, much more broadly, uh, this has created problems with other Islamic countries. So the Swedish ambassador in Indonesia, for example, was summoned by the Indonesian government. We've seen massive demonstrations outside the Swedish embassies in Iraq, in Pakistan, in Jordan, in some of these places, protests have been tried to like, storm the embassy, but it's sort of been kept out by police. And in the case of Ankara, the Swedish embassy there was just closed for public uh, um, access. And I think the, uh, the concert in Istanbul was slightly scaled down for uh, just for certain tasks. It wasn't open to the general public. And I think this marks a slight shift in the general rhetoric so far. Uh, until now, a lot of it has been sort of Erdogan Sweden relations that sort of mm. defined the whole thing. I think a lot of the perspective in Sweden, uh, but also within the wider NATO community, has been well, this is just about Turkey's upcoming election. Erdogan just wants to be in a strong position. One of the things that happened a few days before the Quran burning was there was an effigy put up by uh, a Kurdish solidarity group in Stockholm, uh, hanging Erdogan upside down, sort of signifying, well, uh, you're going to end up like Mussolini. Uh, for being a dictator. Uh, this was again seen sort of a personal dynamic, but now this sort of moved over to Quran burning, this sort of inflamed the wider relationship. It's, it's it's quite it's quite flabbergasting like how this went. I mean, okay, Swedish uh, Turkish relations probably were never the best, but within this one year, this really kind of deteriorated very fast to a very to a uh, to a very high point. Um, do you can you tell us something about the sentiment inside Sweden now about let's say about Turkey and and NATO as well maybe? So this is actually a paradoxical uh, development. So on the one hand, support for NATO has continued to increase throughout, but of course, attitudes towards Turkey has deteriorated. Hmm. And it's worth noting that Sweden has not had a necessarily positive view of Turkey for several years, and it's nothing unusual. Um, sort of viewed as a flawed democracy or oftentimes a non-democracy. And um, Swedish government has uh, has officially been quite supportive throughout the years of Turkish membership of the European Union, although in terms of the general population, that's probably not as supportive. Um, there was a poll that came out, uh, I think in early January, asking people, do you support NATO membership? And separately asking, what should Sweden be willing to do in order to accelerate this? And here we have seen quite a strong position, quite consistent one, where Sweden, Swedes say, yes, we need to join NATO as soon as possible. However, we should not modify ter- uh, Swedish law too much t- to appease the Turks in order to facilitate that. Sort of suggesting that, well, perhaps it's worth waiting a bit longer if that's what it takes to join NATO, but joining NATO is still a priority, it seems. Uh, how many percent do you know? Uh, it's about seventy percent for both. And really? Of, yeah, at this point, yeah. Oh wow, uh, that's that's a very that's that's a huge majority uh, in favor of uh, of NATO membership. Because I always thought Sweden is uh, going to is applying for NATO membership without doing a public referendum, and that mm-hmm. kind of that kind of bothered me because I thought in the pop in the in the general population you might not actually have a fifty percent majority. But you're saying no, no, this it is by now. I think by now, yes. I think when Sweden made a decision uh, back in May, it was still that thing. At that point, it was still going to be a risky referendum, but I think it would have still probably resulted in Sweden joining NATO or applying to join NATO. Uh, but I think over time, it's sort of become a political consensus within Sweden. There hasn't really been any debate on the issue, even in the run up to the decision, but especially since then, I think it's been sort of consistent. Well, let's just join NATO. Now the debate is freedom of speech versus NATO, but it's not necessarily NATO in of itself. So, I mean, the way that it's going at the moment, there is the very real threat that maybe Sweden won't be able to join because it's constantly being blocked, because also Hungary never actually officially said that they would, that they really would agree, right? 
And as if I remember correctly, your argument was that until very recently, Finland always said we only go into NATO hand in hand. But now that seems to be shifting as well. Yeah, so the Finnish foreign minister uh, signaled, well, maybe Sweden, maybe Finland will just have to go ahead without it. They then sort of backed down a bit because it was sort of risking, well, perhaps it's better to have a united front between Sweden, Finland, and NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg and so forth. However, there's a poll that just came out from Finland, uh, I think yesterday, which suggested that a majority of Finnish citizens actually support Finland going in without Sweden, if that's what's necessary. So Sweden could just end up in a position where we're surrounded by NATO members with a, uh, Russia in the Baltic, uh, in St. Petersburg, and then Sweden being left outside of it. I mean, uh, for security issues, you could just still continue like cooperating with NATO very deeply, right? You could just not, uh, Sweden could just not join it. But can you maybe tell me like what, I, I had two other uh, Finnish and a Swedish uh, academic here about half a year ago, and they argued, okay, the, the threat perceived that, is coming from Russia, it's just so high that people by now, they just want to be inside the alliance. Is that still the case? Is is it the threat perception from Russia that drives Swedes to to aspire to become NATO members? I think it's a mixture. So I think it's partially threat perception. Um, I think it's partially also just the fact that there's a political consensus on the issue. And I think European Union membership is a good parallel, actually. When Sweden joined to... Uh, Vote to join the European Union in 1994 and finally joined in 1995. It was a very close decision. I can't remember the exact numbers, 52, 48, 53, 47, something along those lines. But over time, um, the status quo has sort of just become widely accepted to the point that you now have something like 80% support for EU membership. And I think you're seeing a similar development when it came to the NATO question that, well, there's this common position and since this is a shared position, it's not actually being discussed, including at the last election in September of last year. So people have sort of sort of moved on. Well, this is just it. the sky is blue. We're applying to join NATO. And that's sort of there's no need to debate it any further. And I think to some extent, also, the fact that we've now applied to join NATO, there's a concern that, well, we can go back now. So mm. even if I didn't necessarily want to join, well, uh, it's better to join rather than to apply and not join and just uh, be in this limbo state. Because I always found it weird to think that the former Soviet Union was is perceived as less as, as a threat than current Russia to Sweden. I mean, in my view, that just doesn't really make sense. But then that begs the question. So why is in, in a situation where uh, where today's Russia is less of a threat than what, what, what the Soviet Union was to Sweden? Why is this the moment when NATO is most attractive to Swedes and, and the Swedish government? I think there... So one reason would be, uh, I think the, the media atmosphere has just become extremely hostile towards Russia, anything... Uh, that could be perceived as pro-Russian, could be, uh, for example, even calling for a negotiated settlement when it came to Ukraine, a lot of that sort of being uh, acute, uh, alleged of being a form of uh, pro-Putinism, essentially. Mm -hmm. Just to give one recent example, was the Sweden Democrats back in, it would have been, I want to say January 2021, perhaps, or maybe January 2022. But in any case, uh, before the conflict in Ukraine, where the Sweden Democrats had as part of their position let's just maintain a, a balance of power in the Baltic Sea. And they were basically, balance of power basically means being pro-Russian. So I think this is the sort of atmosphere that's sort of been established. From a strategic point of view, I think some believe that during the Soviet Union, sure, uh, there was a greater threat, but joining NATO would have also been a greater threat. Whereas now, because Russia in a sense is weaker, it's also easier to join NATO. So it sort of hmm. created a paradox situation where practically it's easier because Russia is weaker, but then also at the same time, with general consensus, well, Russia is also more dangerous. And and there's there's less of a well, I, I don't know. I, I always think that if you you this neutrality policy of Sweden is 200 years old and it has worked pretty fantastically for 200 years. I mean, this is a relatively big gamble to say, like, let's ditch this and go for something else. Because if if the worst case scenario arises and there is a, a, a Russian uh, uh, NATO war, Finland 
and secondly, Sweden will be front states. Is that mm. something that's being discussed in, in Sweden or not? I think there's an assumption at the moment that if Sweden becomes a member of NATO or, or Finland, that, for that matter as well, uh, there basically won't be war. There's a sort of impression that if you're not a member of NATO, you'll be invaded. And that an invasion is almost a guarantee. And oftentimes in Sweden, this is called an island called Gotland. Mm -hmm. Off the coast of Sweden, which is, I think some people might know, that's where the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline sort of went nearby. Um, and there's a sort of perception that <clears throat> joining NATO is sort of guaranteed to no war. And I think that's where the rationale is oftentimes being uh, brought forward at the moment. Okay. So, and it's, but at the same time, there's also discussion of increasing the military budget. So uh, possibly 3% or 2.73% GDP uh, being spent on the, uh, on the army. Uh, Sweden did bring back partial conscription for, but partially expanding that. So there's just a general uh, desire to militarize, but also a view that uh, there's a, unlikely to be, <clears throat> be an invasion of Sweet, uh, of NATO in general. Yeah, we are we are we are witnessing all over Europe uh, currently this massive um, militarization of the entire continent, which worries me deeply, especially because in the Cold War, we at least still had a couple of neutrals who tried to have some diplomatic interactions. You might know, I mean, the. Uh, Thomas Fisher spoke about uh, the, the the neutrals and the CSCE and uh, all of these uh, these incentives also for neutrals then to try to at least somehow create a balance, especially when it comes to Finland, right? And that that one's going out of the window at the moment. Or do you see any part of the Swedish population that argues for uh, a return to reconciliatory um, diplomacy with with Russia? Um, no, to be honest, not really. Um, so to the extent you can argue this is an attitude towards Putin versus Russia, I mean, I think that can some to some degree be debated. But in general, I think Sweden has quite a negative view of all things Russian, really. Um, so uh, I, it's very difficult to imagine. Although when it came to the sort of mediation effort, I think this actually has great impact for Sweden outside of Europe, actually. Uh, I think Sweden had very marginal role recently when it came to between the West and Russia to begin with. I think Finland perhaps had a bit more on that front, but and even during the Cold War, um, there were times like during the 1970s when Sweden would be quite active in terms of uh, nuclear disarmament issues, but ultimately it became a bilateral Soviet-US issue, so I think Sweden was quite marginalized. I think where Sweden excelled quite a lot was in the third world. And I think the fact that Sweden decided, well, we'll just basically be more neutral in Europe, but be more activists outside of Europe, whether in Asia, Asia, Vietnam being the most notable example, uh, Israel, Palestine, and Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub Africa. That's the question where I'm most curious to see, will people outside of Europe consider Sweden to be a mediator anymore? Uh, we still have our embassy in North Korea, for example, where Sweden is a protected power for the US, Canada, and Australia. Will that still be a lasting thing? Will uh, Sweden a few years ago was involved when it came to uh, a ceasefire in Yemen, will that still be a viable future? We'll see, but I'm more skeptical of that. Um, and when we now look at this kind of strange irony that we have Sweden, a form a former neutral that tries very hard to join NATO and and is a strongly anti-Russian and we have in the south Turkey which is a NATO member but hasn't really put a lot of sanctions on Russia and is blocking Swedish 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 uh, membership uh, uh, is the uh, is this the situation also being um discussed inside Sweden and in 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 the government are people finding this weird or is this is everybody focused on the very the current events about the Quran and free speech mm -hmm. I think people are very narrowly focused at the moment. Um, I think a good example is the fact that Turkey all of last year was threatening another invasion of Syria, for example. Mm -hmm. And this is something that in, uh, animated Swedish, like I said, caused the arms export ban in the first place. As far as I'm aware, there's been no public statement on the issue uh, from the Swedish government. And, and it ended up not happening. I mean, there were a few airstrikes, but there was no ground, another ground invasion. But in any case, Sweden didn't say anything on the issue. Uh, the various times, for example, when Erdogan did meet Putin or has even seen him wanting to meet Assad of Syria, uh, 
again, Sweden has been quite very quiet. It's things very narrowly focused. And is afraid of, I guess, causing another uh, issue of contention. If Sweden complains, for example, about Turkey not imposing sanctions, then that might just be another thing complicating Sweden's application to NATO. Right. And there was recently, about a week ago, there was an article in, I think, either the in Foreign Policy, written by the former um, General uh, Secretary General of NATO, Stravides, who kind of contemplated that, oh, if Turkey doesn't start to play ball, then maybe Turkey might be expelled from uh, NATO in order to allow for uh, Finnish and Swedish uh, membership to happen. Do you? He he very clearly says that's not the goal. That's not what we want. We want a Turkish membership, of course. But it's Stravides who said that in an in an official publication. Yeah. Do you judge this to be? Accurate? actually um uh, uh, uh an, an option or is that just a brain fart of of a former general secretary i think it's extremely unlikely i mean in the case of nato in particular there's no expulsion mechanism in the treaty so it, in a technical sense that's not possible in the current framework uh john bolton for example has more recently said that well maybe we should just dissolve nato and re-establish it without turkey of course, that raises other issues of what does it mean to be an ally if you're willing to kick out allies? Um, I I still think Turkey is just too important for uh, uh, the US, uh, more so than for Sweden. Um, it's still a country that borders Iraq, Syria, and Iran. Um, it does still have major influence. The second biggest army still in, uh, in NATO. So I'm not sure to what extent anyone is actually willing to risk that. Especially since, like you said, Sweden, Finland, even if they don't join NATO, are still so heavily integrated into the wider NATO framework that one can maintain those kind of close relations. Uh, just to give one concrete example, the Swedish government announced that it's going to be participating in a NATO uh, Baltic Sea effort when it comes to um, uh, it? air control, essentially, and uh, flight-related issues, joint, uh, joint air patrols, and possibly join ground troops uh, deployments in the Baltic Sea. Now, just looking at the uh, flight patrols, this is a very regional issue. This is not going to involve Turkey in any case. So you might just have a situation where NATO members are partnering with Sweden, Finland, and then keeping Turkey for other related issues. Um, whereas expelling Turkey or moving away from Turkey risks actually pushing Turkey closer to Russia, China, Iran, but also other essential U.S. allies like Saudi Arabia or Egypt, who have been uh, not as closely aligned as Western Europe has been. Right, right, and I mean, for for every practical purposes, there's other other ways to achieve basically the same outcome. You would just we. Is anyone talking about a very old idea that also never materialized, but I think people must still have it on their mind somewhere, which is a Nordic defense community? Uh, is is any of the is any of that around? At the very beginning, like in March of last year, there were some small voices that suggested maybe a Swedish Finnish uh, mutual defense treaty, but I think that was quite quickly dismissed. Um, I think. The most clear statement on the issue has been uh, the Finnish Prime Minister, Sanna Marin, who at one point late last year said, without the US, Europe doesn't have any security. So there's this view that really it's the US that matters. That It's not really NATO, it's just the United States, in a sense. And that right. NATO is a mechanism of being with the US. Right, right. It's being in and the US camp. I think one minor thing that sort of ha occurred, which I think is purely theatrical, was when Sweden and Finland uh, applied to join NATO, several countries, Denmark, Norway, the UK, Iceland, offered security guarantees to Sweden and Finland as part, during the accession process in case if there was an attack on uh, by Russia. But there was no risk of that ever happening. And there's no real deterrence coming from Denmark, for example, being able to, um, it, it being a handful of countries being able to secure uh, Sweden and Finland in that case, any more than the two countries on their own. The, in a sense, you're right. I mean, it is it is a lot of theater because 
you know, like countries go to war not just because you're in a formal alliance. They go they go to war because they uh, they seriously dislike what others do. Belgium was not in a in an alliance with 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 anyone in the First World War, and still countries decided to go to war over it. Mm. Um, they were they were excluded. Belgium was neutral, but people. The whole the whole war basically then started over Belgium being invaded by one, and the other one said, "So this is the red line. We stop it, and, and we go to war." So in a sense, it is the theater, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing that hasn't been discussed whatsoever in Sweden has been what does Article Five actually uh, entail? I think the sort of conventional wisdom is, well, an attack against one is an attack against all. Therefore, the entire alliance is at war. But if you actually read the article itself, it just says each country can choose how to help. So yes. it seems that to to a large extent, it's sort of formalizing the, the sort of covert relation Sweden already had, but also yeah. being more of a signal towards Russia. I find it actually. I, I find it so ironic because if you compare Article Five of NATO with Article Sixteen of the League of Nations, Article Sixteen of the League of Nations is actually much stronger. It's way more straightforwardly formulated that these countries then have to commit military uh, equipment to the defense of the others. Article 5, you don't. You don't actually have to. Um, and there's a similar issue, since you mentioned the Nordic defense uh, alternative. There have been some people, again, this very early on, didn't last very long, about whether the European Union offers a mutual defense component. Mm -hmm. And the Swedish government has at various points said, uh, since I want to say the early 2000s, that Sweden cannot be neutral on a European Union conflict. That I, if an EU member state is attacked, Sweden would not be neutral. And there was some pushing for, for example, the Social Democratic Youth Wing, I think, or at least part of their championship, pushed for uh, using the EU as a mechanism of mutual defense rather than NATO. But again, that was quite quickly dismissed. And as we're seeing now, there's a convergence between the EU and NATO that's almost yeah. entirely overlapping with a few exceptions. That's true. And there is an Irish, there is the so-called Irish clause, which would allow uh, members of the common defense and security policy to opt out of military, uh, militarily help uh, in case one was one was attacked. But uh, one of my main points is you can only be neutral if you want to be neutral. If you don't want to be neutral, it's, you're just not going to be. You're just going to give it up. That's why That's why Ukraine will... There is no Ukrainian neutrality unless the people in power in Ukraine and the government in power in Ukraine wants it, wants it to be that way. So, And I, it seems that Sweden is done with it. Huh? 200 years is enough. Indeed. One thing I would modify is that arguably neutrality ended in 1995 when we joined the European Union. And since then, this would be non-alignment. Yeah, right. Uh, but I think in the conventional uh, uh, mindset, even in the Swedish population, neutrality and non-alignment has sort of been used interchangeably. And yeah, both are now essentially dead. Although from the policy perspective, it's really non-alignment that's now finally being buried. Right. Then again, uh, when we look at history, uh, Sweden was never neutral because it wanted to be. It was always neutral out of a, a lack of options. Yeah. <laughs> like, even in the Second World War, they were neutral because of the of a belief in it. Well, Sweden yeah. was neutral because there was nothing else to be. So we will yeah. we will find out if the new Cold War, as we are experiencing it now, is going to play out in the same way again or not. Uh, Naman, we will certainly stay in touch and hopefully talk again. Thank you very much for the insights. Thank you very much. Enjoy this conversation.